the New York Times article was really remarkable because they've been able to get, they were able to get an answer to a question I've been asking for a long time that no one would answer. And that is, uh, what is the cutoff, the threshold that the labs are using to determine whether they consider a test positive? Because the way these PCR tests work, these polymerase chain reaction tests work is they find a tiny microscopic amount of genetic material by amplifying it over and over and over and over again. And the threshold at which you consider a test positive is critical because if you double the amount of genetic material every time you run one of these cycles and you run say 23 cycles uh, and you still haven't found it, there probably is not infectious virus there. There might be an old dead fragment or something like that. And if you keep running the cycles up to 30, 35, 40 cycles, you can make almost anything test positive. If somebody had the disease three or four months ago and there's still old dead virus somewhere in their body, they're gonna test positive if you run it enough cycles, if you just keep running it over and over and over. And even if there's just some contamination in the room or on the plates or in the regents, uh, in, the, in the reagents, you can get a totally false positive and you get strings of them, especially the Thermo Fisher test has had a warning from the FDA that if you don't clean the plates extremely carefully, every true positive can give you a whole cluster of false positives, uh, especially if you have these very high cycles, because if there's any microscopic amount there, you double it and double it and double it 40 times, you're going to get a positive. And so the New York Times uh, was able to actually get an answer from several states, three states, Nevada, New York, and Massachusetts, they found out that the labs in those states are doing 37 to 40 amplification cycles. They're essentially doubling the amount of genetic material 37 to 40 times. That's a big problem because uh, the best data we have is a study from Oxford that says that if you do it more than 23 times, it's probably not infectious virus. Uh, the New York Times used a little bit different standard. They said 30 is kind of where the cutoff should be. They had some experts from Harvard and they're suggesting that number, but they got the, they got remarkable data uh, from these three states, which is that if the if it had been set at 30, and it's very very unlikely that anyone who needs to have their material doubled more than 30 times actually has any infectious virus, is sick, can infect anyone. It's all, almost impossible. Um, they found that if the threshold had been set at the level that's actually infectious, 90 percent of the cases in those states in recent days would have been negatives. And so 90% of the case numbers in Nevada, New York, and Massachusetts were people who are not infectious, who have old dead virus in them, uh, and therefore cannot infect anyone. And I just thought this was such an astonishing bombshell, a revelation that quantified something we knew was a problem, but we weren't able to put a number on. It was in the New York Times of all places. Um, and then the next day, the New York Times went back to hyping case counts and acted like it didn't happen. Yeah. And people are proceeding this week like the case count is the be all and end all even though we now know 90% of those people are probably not infectious, at least in those three states and maybe in others if they're following the same lab practices. Wow. And to that point, you also highlighted the work of a German virologist who said really ultimately, I mean, it looks like it's five days tops for, I guess, the infectious period for this this virus. And so, you know, the 14 days, that's not something, you know, that, that's, I mean, he said that that was egregious. Uh, this, uh, it, uh, Drosten, Christian Drosten, uh, and he has a podcast about this. You highlighted his work as well. Uh, is he alone in this thought that it's a five day, I guess, infectious period? Well, the, the most recent CDC uh, data that they published on their website says that people can be infectious for up to seven days after symptom onset. In, in some rare cases, um, it can be as much as 10. And in the very rare cases where someone's very, very, very sick, like a hospitalization, severely ill, uh, they said that in those very rare cases of very severe illness, you could be infectious all the way to 20 days. But the CDC specifically said no one has ever been found with infectious virus in them at more than three weeks, even though the tests can show positive for right. up to 12 weeks or even longer uh, because they're so, so extremely sensitive. So uh, this new finding from Germany is interesting because it's uh, even shorter than what the CDC has been saying. The CDC has been saying seven to 10 days after symptom onset, you can be infectious. And now the most recent result from Germany is saying it, it looks like it's more like five days. Right.
there's so many, and, and as you know, this everything about this from testing to the vaccine, everything becomes, and really ultimately kind of both sides, becomes so incredibly politicized that it's really hard for people who just want to get basic information about this stuff to to, to get the find the best resources. Where can they get the truth with it? I mean, we've we've shut down the entire world because of this, and, and our country is going through, a, obviously, as you know, difficult economic times. I mean, it's weighing heavily in the election. What, what in looking at this and 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 trying to state the thirty thousand foot view, is this just we just we're starting at ground zero with a completely new virus that we've never seen before? Is that why there seems to be you know the mess ups with regards to you know counting how tests are processed and the over focus on case number instead of the other variables that you uh, so succinctly listed? Or is it you know is it political? Is it that malicious? I mean, if if you had to come to a conclusion on that, what would what would you tell people? I think the early mistakes were made uh, because of the extent to which China lied to the world and the World Health Organization gave very misleading and deceptive information to try to help uh, cover up for China. And because China lied for so long, said this wasn't transmitted human to human, right. downplayed everything, kept uh, stonewalled the rest of the world, hid information. When they did finally start giving us information, even though a lot of it was very accurate, including the age distribution being very skewed towards the oldest uh, people, and uh, China very early on said asymptomatic people are not infectious, we don't consider them cases. So China actually started giving us a lot of very good information, but by the time they did that, we didn't trust anything coming out of China. Right. So we didn't believe them. So we didn't believe any of that data because they had been lying to us. And I think that we saw some of those early outrageous uh, pictures and facts out of Italy and sort of the whole Western world panicked. And once you panic, it's very hard to ever sort of straighten things out and to, to get back to sort of a normal view and a normal approach to things. And I think we've sort of been locked in. We've been in sort of this this locked in kind of path dependency for many months now where even though the facts have become increasingly clear uh, to admit that the facts are clear would require our elected officials and our so-called experts to admit they were wrong at the beginning and they made disastrously bad decisions like calling for lockdowns that had enormous negative consequences. And I just, you know, most human beings, especially politicians and, uh, you know, the, the eminent experts, don't seem to have it in them to admit they were wrong. Yeah. And so they're trying to look for an escape path without admitting that. And uh, that's, I think, why we're, we've been in such a difficult situation for so long. Oh, and, and it's, and it's um, as you're, you're right, it's made us incredibly distrustful of anything, not just that we see from China, but also because our own CDC has been going back and forth on so many things. Um, two really quick things for you. You wrote about the paper antigen test as well, uh, the FDA's objection to these. There's a lot of things that the FDA has done during this course of uh, pandemic reaction that's kind of made me, I, I just think that there are certain organizations, cer certain bureaucracies that become so big they cannot react quickly. I think that this is one of them. Um, give me your thoughts on that because you, you have a great piece on Amer AmericanCommitment.org addressing this. Yeah, look, I mean, the FDA is really the uh, heart of the problem with testing. Uh, first of all, remember in the very beginning, we didn't have any tests at all because there were no approved private sector tests. Yeah. The idea was the CDC test alone was going to be adequate, and that test really didn't work very well. And we had kind of a, a huge kind of, we fell way behind. And I think that set up a lot of the mis other mistakes that were made. Then to try to make up for that error, FDA made the opposite error, which is they just started approving emergency use authorizations for every one of these PCR tests. And and, you know, these companies are putting in, hey, we're going to do 40 amplification cycles. And the FDA says, sure. And they sign off on that. And now we have this massive false positive problem. And uh, we're getting people getting positives based on an infection they had, you know, three months ago. And they haven't been in, they were only infectious for five days. But they're testing positive now three months later. And they're going to be told they can't go to work. And they're going to be isolated uh, based on a test that's totally calibrated wrong. And uh, meanwhile, the FDA, until last week, had not approved any tests that give you an instant result that tells you basically whether you are infectious or not. They finally have approved uh, an Abbott test, but they didn't approve it for home use. So there's this test now for $5. You can it, It'll basically tell you whether you're infectious or not. And there are some false positives and false negatives involved. So if you do get a positive, you want to confirm it with another test. It's not a guarantee. Right. Um, but it's sort of what I've been calling for, which is you know a cheap, you take it, you get the result right away test. But... They only approved it for use in a pharmacy or a doctor's office, and the results are automatically reported to the government, right. which means all the people who are hesitant to test are still not going to use it. We need a home test that you can take yourself and you decide what to do with the results. And until the FDA approves one of those, 
uh, you know, we're not really going to have a test that works, in my opinion. Yeah. We and we don't even I mean, do we really even have a true idea as to how many and I, I don't like I'm with you. I don't like focusing on the number of cases, especially when it doesn't it seem it's it's like a fraction of what was reported. And I worry about how this is going to affect the way that the vaccine that Fauci and others keep talking about that may or may not come out this October, the way that this is released and controlled and in some areas, maybe even possibly regulated. What are your thoughts on on that and, and particularly that vaccine discussed? Well, I'm pretty concerned uh, with the rush timeline on a vaccine. Uh, we've uh, we've never tried a lot of these vaccine technologies before. Moderna is a company that's never delivered a product to market before of any kind. Uh, they're trying a pretty novel platform. Uh, it's not a traditional vaccine. It's uh, it's a messenger RNA vaccine. Um, you know, they're doing a large scale trial now. And if the results of that are sufficiently robust, that people have confidence that it's going to be a good vaccine that's going to confer benefits and it's not going to have much downside. I don't have a great problem with bringing it to market, but I do have a big problem if they try to mandate it, uh, given the rush timeline. And I think a lot of people are going to be uh, very reasonably looking at the risk for them and say, hey, there's almost no risk with this disease for me without a vaccine. I'm not going to take a vaccine unless there's a lot more evidence and a lot more track record to see that it's safe. And so uh, I think we have to see what the trials come out with, see what the data is, see how strong it is to, to determine if that timeline is realistic, it seems very aggressive to me. Uh, my big concern would be uh, forced vaccination. I'd be totally against that. But if they want to publish the data and if it's safe and they want to make it available to people, I don't have a problem with that. There you go. Well, Phil Carpin, we appreciate uh, your digging into all of this and the way you explain it as well. AmericanCommitment.org. Uh, find him on Twitter, K-E-R-P-E-N. Phil, always good to see you. Thank you so much for your time today.